Welcome to a new episode of DTV. I'm here with Scott McGill. He's the president and CEO of Coriel Life Sciences. He's a recognized expert in uh, bioinformation, using the tech power of technology and, and cutting edge genetic research to empower very targeted and precise medical care. He's really passionate about educating others as an advocate for the advancement of precision medicine and has grown Coriel Life Sciences into, into an internationally trusted provider of comprehensive medical, medication risk management, bioinformatics, and genetic interpretation and reporting services. So, Scott, welcome. Thank you, Avery. Good to talk to you today. Well, I'm really excited to have you here. You know, You've been spending a lot of time, you know, in the whole, obviously the whole area of life sciences and healthcare. And what's really interesting to me is, you know, how you're working to unlock digital, how digital can, technology can really affect life sciences. So what is it that first got you really excited about the use of data in life sciences? What was kind of the trigger, the triggering moment or event that, that for you? Um, you know, there's, there's so much data being generated in healthcare, uh, both at the patient level and the population level, that, uh, you know, without good tools and technologies, it's just going wasted. Um, when, when we think about the traditional way of, of providing medicine, it was, you know, uh, you hope you have a good doctor and you hope that through their education and experience, they can pull together uh, the right treatment plan for you. The reality of the situation is, you know, through testing and various encounters that we have with the healthcare system, um, there's so much data that's being collected on an individual. And if you start to include genetic information, you can increase that literally by billions of points of information per individual. Um, we need good systems and tools to start to derive insight from that so that we can care for people in a more tailored way. But that also happens at the population level. So it's not enough to treat an individual. We also need to know as systems, as healthcare providers, how can we look across an entire population and derive uh, trends and understand how to risk stratify those populations so that we're focusing resources on those that are most acutely affected by health conditions and where the, the benefit of those additional resources can be felt the best. Ultimately, the result, of course, is at the individual level, we feel better, right? Patients feel better because they're getting the right treatment. Um, but at the population level, we, we can reduce costs by not applying those, those resources to the wrong people or to better applying resources to those who need it. So for me, I, I get very excited about the insights we could derive from data um, and thinking about just the, the amount of data that lives in the healthcare system is, uh, is frankly overwhelming. So it's a, it's a great space to be in. One thing I'm curious is, um, it looks like there are benef there's benefits potentially, I would think, for this beyond simply, uh, you know, kind of ther you know, therapeutic prescriptive benefits. Um, how do you start to capture those? Because there's a lot of work now about how do I do preventative care mm -hmm. and how can I do things? And, and I look at a lot of digital devices now where I can get... Um, well, I, I guess a simple example is, is a lot of people are using continuous glucose monitoring right now that, that are not diabetic, but they're doing it for performance enhancement reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see the same thing occurring in the, your field around the, the genetic interaction? Yeah. So genetics, you know, we're, we're focused on pharmacogenomics. There's lots of different sciences that are adjunct to that, like nutrigenomics and, and uh, yeah. you know, looking at the microbiome and other areas that would be considered less clinically useful in the, the immediate uh, need of a physician. But from a patient perspective, you know, we, I think we've all become a bit more medically curious than uh, previous generations. And I think that's been driven a lot by things like direct to consumer genetic testing companies and, you know, organizations like I can go and effectively order lab tests now as a consumer and receive those results direct. Whereas you wouldn't have ever thought of doing something like that, you know, 20 years ago. So I, and certainly the advent of wearables that are tracking how many steps we take and our heart rate and all of those things, we're, we're in a, a state now where we've got so much more information at a personal level that adding additional factors like genetics or microbiomics or nutrigenomics, it's just a natural addition to that. So how that again gets sort of integrated into how we think about our own health is something that you know happens at a personal level. Yeah. Um, if I you know find that uh, I don't respond well to, to gluten, um, well then I'm probably going to adjust my diet right because of that. 
Um, similarly, you know, if you find that you took a, a panel genetic test for pharmacogenomics and you found that um, you won't respond well to a certain statin, well, that's great information to have should you need to go on that statin, right? It's like a, a genetic form of an allergy test, so to speak. So I think all of this is driving change at the consumer level for sure because of that natural curiosity that's been driven by the availability of this kind of information. You know, as, as you, you know, as you're looking at all the promise of genetic science, is there a specific, um, for the viewers, is there a specific thing they should be thinking about, about this is a, a great opportunity in all likelihood for, for them to a specific disease category or a specific, um, you mentioned statins. I mean, I don't know if that's the, the perfect one or there's a better one to think about. Um, well, there, there are certainly uh, um, disease condition areas that are more related from a medication standpoint, more related to genetic variation than others. Um, and certainly uh, mood disorders, uh, mental health, right? So depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, those, uh, the medications that are used to treat those particular conditions are very much affected by genetic variation. And they're also very costly to get wrong. So when we prescribe a new anxiety medication or depression medication, it often has to be um, taken for six weeks or more to determine whether or not it's even useful for that person. If you can shortcut that journey to the right treatment plan by eliminating certain options right up front, because of a known genetic variation for someone, we can get them to better health faster. We can reduce you know, hospitalizations and doctor's visits and all of the, the heavy costs that comes along with not having the right treatment. Um, but certainly cardiac disease is another big one where drugs like Plavix and Warfarin, uh, blood thinners that we know are kind of the most uh, prescribed uh, solutions for people who have heart attacks and blood clots and strokes. Those are heavily um, actually regulated by genetic variation um, so much so actually that uh, a, a very long running class action suit by the state of Hawaii um, just settled for uh, north of $800 million uh, against the pharmaceutical companies for not disclosing that genetic variation is impactful for taking Plavix, right? So you've got a, a third of the world's population can't take that drug with any, any degree of efficacy because of a genetic concern. I'm actually one of those people. I, I don't take Plavix, but I know because I've taken a genetic test, I should never take Plavix. Um, and that's a really good thing for me to know because at the time in which I might need to take Plavix, that's not when I want to find it out. You know, <laughs> I'm on the table with a heart attack or a stroke or something. So um, I think, you know, from a, an individual standpoint, is now the time right? Uh, of course, you know, the more information you have about your own health um, and the availability of this kind of information gathering tools is, is now out there, right? It's, it's out there both through your physicians, which is always the way uh, to handle genetic testing. Um, but there's also some direct to consumer companies that do a good job of supporting this kind of, of science um, and can help you to understand what it means for you. What do you think the next big are the, is mental health? And I, I, the mental health one, I think, really um, struck struck me because of the the amount of impact the the, the pandemic has had uh, yeah. in general on mental health. Uh, is that probably the it, kind of the the, the going to be the the one thing that really pushes forward for the interaction between genetic genetic testing and and, and pharma? Um, well, certainly mental health uh, it makes a lot of sense, and, and it's more acute now because of the, the COVID pandemic, as you mentioned. Um, pain management and the opioid crisis, these are other areas where pharmacogenomic testing can make a real significant impact, not only because we can decide you know, when someone does have chronic pain, whether or not to prescribe a certain analgesic or not, um, but also we can look at markers that can help us to determine whether or not they have a predilection for addiction in the first place. So those combined can really be a very powerful tool for pain management to help us to reduce the, uh, you know, the, the lifelong effects of people who do get addicted. Um, but there's certainly, I think, from, from a data perspective and you know, what, what we should be looking at um, moving ahead, I don't think it's, it's individual disease areas that are going to drive this forward. I think what really is going to drive it forward is integration and acceptance by the payers. So I think... When we get to a point where um, your PBM, your pharmacy benefit management company says, uh, you've just been prescribed a new drug before we actually fulfill that prescription, uh, we, we'd like you to take a genetic test to ensure that it's actually going to work for you. That's what's really gonna drive it forward. Um, and that, that benefits everybody, right? That benefits the, the PBM and the, ultimately the payer 
um, because they're not paying for a drug that's not working. And it certainly benefits the patient because now they're getting a drug that's actually going to work for them. Yeah. And I think we're really getting there. We're, there there's been a, a tremendous amount of recognition by um, the FDA, which we hadn't seen before about pharmacogenomics and its effects. Um, and certainly from uh, CMS, the um, Medicare and payers now adopting actual reimbursement for these tests. So the, the, um, I think the pendulum has swung quite a bit on, uh, on sort of the acceptance of that particular technology. Um, that, doesn't in, it, that doesn't say anything for other uses of genomics or nutrigenomics or anything else. So I think they, they all have their own little uh, journeys that they're going to have to go on for true acceptance. Got it. Well, this has been really insightful. Um, are there any last thoughts you'd want people to have in mind as they think about pharmacogenomics and, and the use of data in, in healthcare? Um, well, it's a really exciting time for sure. I, I think for um, our organization, you know, the next big thing is, is likely the application of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence on top of this data so that the, uh, you know, the human error that we see in just lack of, of clinical decision support and lack of having access to all that data uh, sort of goes away with uh, machines able to really have access to all data at all times. So yeah. that, that really is the brave new frontier, I think, and what we'll start to see emerge in the next five to 10 years. Um, certainly the data sets that are gonna be required to train up tools like that are being generated today. So I think it's, it's not early at all to participate both uh, on an individual level and certainly families that are suffering various health conditions um, now's the time to get engaged because the, the DNA doesn't change. So the knowledge that can be gleaned from your genetic code will continue to evolve, but having the test early, having the test now, you know, even if you're not suffering, um, can be a valuable asset for your health care for the rest of your life. Well, good. Well, thank you very much for sharing. It's, uh, it's an exciting, exciting area and a great example of some of the innovation that can occur when you you overlap, uh, I think multiple disciplines are advancing quite quickly, being you know medical and genomics and, and digital. So thank you for your time and, and sharing the insights. Um, for people watching, uh, please subscribe to DTV and uh, look forward to your continuing to, to share this uh, content with friends. Thank you. Thanks so much, Avery.